Hi, we're back with our look at the second episode of House of the Dragon, The Rogue Prince. When the episode opens, six months have passed since the death of Queen Aima. The troubles with the Triarchy and the Stepstones have grown, and Lord Corliss is trying to get Viserys to do something about it. At the same time, Prince Daemon has really taken umbrage at what's happened, and he's taking up residence on Dragonstone with some of the gold cloaks, and some of the small council are seeing this as basically him occupying it. Viserys is also being pressured to remarry, with Lord Corliss proposing his very young daughter, Lena, as a suitable bride. Matters with Damon end up coming to a head when Viserys learns that he's to marry Missaria and has taken a dragon egg to give to her unborn child. Otto Hightower is dispatched to recover the egg and end Damon's occupation of the Citadel, but it takes Rhaenyra arriving on Syrax to convince her uncle to give up. After Rhaenyra returns to King's Landing, Viserys announces that he will marry Alicent Hightower rather than Lena Valorian, shocking Rhaenyra and very much angering Lord Corlys. <clears throat> When it comes to the changes this week, there are several notable changes that tie into what we could also discuss as background information. So we will begin with the changes that mainly concern the current story and leave the rest for the background section. So it'll, it'll bleed into each other a little bit here. So the episode starts with us learning that the Lord Commander of the King's Guards, Ryan Redwine, has passed away after being ill for some time. and. This is happening much later in the, in, in the show than it did in the book. In the book, he died in 105 AC. This, of course, that pushes uh, Kristen Cole's appointment to when Rhaenyra is also older. In fact, in the book, Kristen Cole ends up catching her attention when she is seven years old. And at her whim, and her, her father's whim, you know, she begs him to make Kristen Cole her personal protector. And her sworn shield. And then the year after that, Ryan Redwine dies and he's appointed to a King's Guard. Uh, they really don't talk much about Ryan Redwine. I, no. this, is kind of, this is where it kind of bleeds background and changes because uh, Ryan Redwine is mentioned in the very first book as one of the greatest King's Guard that ever served. Uh, people were kind of surprised, I think, in Fire and Blood. He is mentioned, he's mentioned very notably winning some tournaments. Um, but we don't really get the full sense of how great he was supposed to be, how chivalrous and how skilled. Um, but he was very skilled. And then, of course, he's remembered in the Storm of Swords as, you know, one of the greatest knight of his day, but also one of the worst hands to ever serve a king. Uh, he was appointed by King Jaehaerys to serve as his hand. He lasted less than a year when he was replaced because he just, he was no good at it. He, he remained the Lord Commander of the King's Guard, of course, but he just wasn't cut for that. Yeah, being a, a great knight doesn't necessarily make no. you a, a great hand. No. Okay. Now, they also tweak a little bit when it comes to Cole, because uh, the, the idea that he is uh, the son of the uh, Lord Ondarion steward, that, that is accurate, but uh, we also have at the tournament, of course, Alison, when he takes off his, his uh, helmet, oh, he's, he's Dornish. And um, this this is an addition. We we don't actually know. I mean, he could have Dornish blood being I think, on the Dornish marches. Exactly. I mean, um, it makes sense. Probably fairly unlikely that Lord Dondarrion's steward, as in the father, would be Dornish, given the animosity against the Dornish in the Dornish marches. Yeah, they're not. Dorn is not part of the Seven Kingdoms properly. No. Uh, you still see it on the crown. You see the House Martell sigil. The Targaryens, ever since Aegon the Conqueror, have claimed to have conquered Dorn, claimed to rule Dorn. Um, very much a sh uh, like it's, how... It's, like, it's an oversight for now. We'll fix it eventually. It's very much like how the uh, English kings claimed at a certain point to be kings of France as well, uh, mm. when they obviously weren't. Um, <laughs> Speaking of Cole, then he is selected. I, the scene is really cool in the sense that you get all oh, this wonderful surcoats and heraldry. I like that's an aspect of the, the previous show that didn't really they didn't really get into. No. Very bright, very cool. Lovely to see some of the houses that kind of like House Karen of Night Song, uh, House Malister, the Crake Halls get mentioned. Very cool stuff. Um, yeah, but uh, anyways, Cole. Uh, there's a, a remark from Harold Westerling. Oh, we passed all the tests, which is like, there's no formal testing program to become a Kingsguard Knight in the books. No, 
no, it seems like basically we've taken them through the uh, one of those uh, maybe obstacle courses of you know, America's best warrior or whatever. <laughs> uh, yeah, like, American American Ninja or whatever it's called. American Ninja is a movie, though, but something uh, Ninja Warrior, America's Ninja <laughs> Warrior. Like, I, what else at least it shows? Those. It's like we've run them through the tests now, and we're gonna see which one we, we yeah. prefer here, or, or is it like writing tests or uh, checking if you know your letters and if you can handle bookkeeping or I mean. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, but but um... yeah, I don't know what they've done. Actually, interesting. Speaking about that scene, uh, Rainier very prominently mentions as you know, start preparing for the investiture to invest him with his white cloak and have yeah. him say the vows. And uh, it, it kind of caught my attention because it said in such a way like, oh, we're they're intending to show us the investiture, yeah. and they didn't. But then I saw, I guess from one of the behind the scenes, they showed a moment. Filming where they were very clearly showing Rhaenyra putting on the white cloak. So they, they did film it. They right. cut it for time. I would love to see them to release that perhaps on the, the Blu-ray or something. Yeah, so you kind know, of that, see that what they did nice, with it. Um, nice. and, you know, we're actually interviewing Ryan Condal in a couple of days, I think. Uh, I think I'm going to ask him, like, hey, can you tell them to can put that scene <laughs> as one of the cut scenes? That would be really cool to see. Agreed. Um, another change in this episode, which concerns sort of the present story, is that the rift between Viserys and Daemon is made a bit more dramatic for the show. Now, in the book, basically what happens is that when the Air for a Day quarrel happens and Viserys gets really angry with Daemon and then promptly names Rhaenyra Princess of Dragonstone, which is a title that Daemon actually never held. He coveted it, but he, he had never been formally named heir. So, he leaves in a huff when that happens and takes up residence on Dragonstone with Missaria. But when he does that, he actually resigns from the gold cloaks. So he does not have an army of gold cloaks there to occupy the camp castle. He's simply living there and it is one of the Targaryen residences. Right. So it's nothing odd that he would be living there, I think, even if he's not the Prince of Dragonstone. Um, and then Missaria actually becomes pregnant. And he does take an egg to place in the child's cradle. Um, there's no sense that he has to sneak in anywhere and steal it. Probably the Targaryens actually have access to yeah. the eggs, I'm going to guess. I guess I wouldn't even say necessarily, like, even on the show, they don't exactly say he stole it per se. It's like uh, when Viserys asked the dragon keeper, you know, how could he do it? What's Prince Damon? I mean, it, I suppose. Of course, it's he true. could go. Yes. They didn't think he would do what he did. Yeah. Um, Yes, they probably are allowed to come in and pet the eggs or, or <laughs> whatever, <they do. laughs> whatever they do with them. Uh, but Viserys does insist that he should return the egg and send Missaria away, as well as return to his own wife. And uh, it's said that Damon does so, albeit with ill grace. So uh, he actually sends Missaria back to Lys, where she came from, even though they met in King's Landing. And then she loses the child when crossing the narrow sea. The, the, the weather is bad. Uh, and then the storm. So he blames uh, Viserys for this and that worsens his feelings about Viserys. Uh, and there's actually no involvement from Rhaenyra in, in any of this. She's still quite young and so she's not flying over on, on Cyrax to, to end it. Uh, obviously they wanted her involvement, they wanted the confrontation between her, him, her and Damon, which is a very good scene. It's an excellent scene. It's, it's the, an excellent the, scene. Both visually, the effects of it, yeah. and also uh, the way they play it. Um, Matt Smith, I, I love some of the, like uh, at the final moments where he's considering his, where she's told him, you need know, to cut me down. Yeah. And he, he's just kind of, you can just looking and kind of, and fine. And he tosses the egg back kind of nonchalantly and goes away. I mean, she's basically calling his bluff there, and she's like, damn, yeah. he got me. Uh, I mean, to, the the one thing I guess is all of this is, does it entirely make sense? It's, it's a very dramatic temper tantrum, basically. Even especially the whole thing where, I guess you can see where they're gonna say, well, the history is recorded that she was pregnant, but she lost a child, um, and they're saying, well, no, but it, it never was. It was a lie, and they it just somehow Rhaenyra and Otto and them didn't inform. The rest, you know, Melos was there as well, I believe. Mm. They don't inform everyone else. Oh, actually, it was a lie. She was never pregnant in the first place. She should record that. And so again, they're, they're playing a little loose with, with the history, like how far we're just picking and choosing. What they've done, obviously, is to try to amp up the drama by yeah. bringing these sort of conflicts together into one space and then finding a way, instead of him just saying, fine, to actually do something with it. Mm. One other little change, 
I, I obviously it's something where they can say, well, everyone understands her to be from Lys, uh, Masoria. But she actually mentions to Damon afterward when she's talking about that she had been sold so many times, beginning from some homeland that she doesn't even remember. That's true. So uh, she's not Lysenia, I guess, seems to be the idea. No, that seems to be the idea. Um, I did wonder a little bit about them when she makes the point that she's made sure that she'll never be bothered by children. Uh, I don't think hysterectomies are a thing in either Essos or Westeros, so... I guess magic. Ma I guess a magical charm or some ritual to. Um, there's no evidence. There's no evidence of anything like, like that. Uh, in the not in, certainly not in this era. I mean, maybe maybe in the past when magic was stronger, you could, the blood mages of Valyria could do things like that. But yes, but what exactly she's supposed to have done? Um, Unless she, I don't know. Can can you do something to deliberately injure your uterus such a way that you can't carry? Uh, I, I mean, guess very you risky. can, but it sounds really risky yeah. and uncomfortable. <laughs> anyway, that, that's what she claims. Yes. Uh, in any case. All right. So background details, and as we said, this is going to have to do some changes as well because it bleeds into the background details, but. Valyria features fairly prominently in this episode since Viserys has shown us building a massive model of Valyria that he's showing to Alicent. And um, while it has some elements of the Valyria that uh, uh, George described to Ted Naismith for the art for the World of Ice and Fire, it is also fairly different. Um, to start with, Viserys says that the city was built into the, si uh, the side of a volcano, or the the volcano, he says. And that makes it sound as if there was just the one volcano in Valyria. Um, but across the peninsula of old Vis Valyria, there were actually 14 volcanoes, the 14 flames. I think not just, just across the peninsula, I think they were kind of just around the main city, old Valyria, the Valyrian city. Yeah, well, I mean, so, I think we don't know how much of the peninsula actually yes. the city took up, sure. whether that was spreading yeah. out among, but it does seem like it was supposed to have been among all of the volcanoes, or most of them anyway. And uh, descriptions of the city focus on the immensely tall towers that allowed the nobility to live high above the canals of molten lava that were actually running through its streets, basically, so you weren't, you weren't walking the streets of Valyria. They were very hot. Yeah, they were very hot, and only the lower classes and the slaves lived and worked further down. And died there. Uh, and died there. Um, Viserys also mentions a place called the Nogrion, where the blood mages practiced their art. And it's very Greek. It does sound quite Greek. Uh, I'm sure say. it's Valyrian. I'm sure yeah, Peterson yeah. did it. But. Uh, it's probably a name that Peterson uh, created from his High Valyrian. Uh, it is not something that has been mentioned before. I suppose it's possible that George has created it in working for on the winds of winter and actually uh, that it is something that he will talk about. He has been talking a little bit more in interviews about the Blood Mages. Absolutely true, actually, that he, he brought it up. Um, and actually, you know, the, the new intro for that we've, we've mm. now seen for the episode uh, kind of really draws on the idea of blood. Uh, with, with the blood running through the model of a city. And, like the and lava, basically. Like the lava would yeah. have. I, I just don't mention it, but uh, uh -huh. it's just strange. I, I, you didn't think they would mention it because it's like, it's like a very heavy metal kind of <laughs> detail. Like when, when, when you know, I, with Ted Naismith, you know, we were we were helping George and, and, and Ted kind of come up with it and we gave him what information we had, the way they sculpted the stone with their magic, okay. and the way they had these topless towers, as mm. Catelyn called them. So, um, and he did this, and it was really, really nice. And George kind of, oh, it was pretty nice, but it, it feels more like Elvish Towers. Let yeah. me give you more information. And he, he explained, like, yeah, there's molten metal in canals that they use for their fire magics <laughs> running through the city. And the, the dragon lords live in the, the top of these towers. Like, some of them will live their entire lives never setting foot on the ground. They'll just yeah. flip from tower to tower on their dragons. I think there were bridges as well between some there of them. There were some of them would have bridges. bridges but others, you'd basically, you'd have your little, uh, like, a, like one of those helicopter pads. You'd have your dragon pad outside, and you'd fly with your dragon to visit your neighbor. And uh, uh, this is insane to think about it. So uh, I thought um, I, the yeah. architecture also, I, it see, looked more like I guess um, like Babylonian sort of Egyptian, a like little bit like, and yeah. And, but also at the same time, also you can see the the design language being taken from the Game of Thrones, and also now here Dragonstone Citadel. Yes, angular kind of, forbidding. but not the more 
organically sculpted that seems to have yeah. been a part of the, the of the Valyrian architecture actually. The other big piece of background I want to talk about is the Valorians. Uh, this episode kind of finally casts more information, provides more information about how the Valorians are supposed to relate to the Targaryens as Valyrians in regards to their history recently and in the past. The Valorians in the books, like the Targaryens, are Valyrian nobility. And they, but they have never been dragon lords, and this is the same. This is what they say is happening in uh, the show. They say that they are of uh, pure Valyrian blood, um, claiming even at the end of the episode when Damon and Corlys are speaking that some of the texts say that the Valyrians are an older house than the Targaryens, even, and uh, that they are. It's stressed several times when the marriage is discussed that she, uh, she's got pure Valyrian blood, she's got unimpeachable Valyrian blood, uh, and uh, will make a perfect match right. for Viserys in that regard. So that, like that, one of the things when the casting was first announced was that well, you don't know that. I mean, because Corlys's skin color is not explicitly described, he he himself could be half black, he could be half Summer Islander, his father could have married one. We don't know. And in theory, yes, kind of, I mean, you, you, maybe, but there's all this other stuff around it that says that can't be the case. And on the show, they agree that's not the case. They have always been as they are. Um, okay, I mean, and it goes further than that because as they talk of the Valorians as um, a family that had to scratch its living out of a sea, which is it's a bit of an exaggeration. Yeah. They made their wealth by, you know, they basically, you know, passing trade through the gullets to Westeros. They would charge tolls, they would provide protection, they would offer a port for people to trade at. Scratching a living, I guess, compared to the Targaryens, I suppose. And I guess compared to, I mean, it's true that Corlys vastly enriches uh, the Valarians with his nine voyages, and we see some of the mentors of those uh, in the hall when he's speaking yeah. to Damon. I mean, he uh, absolutely uh, raised uh, their their profile in in the present, but they have been one of the oldest allies to the Targaryens. They, um, their ships were instrumental in ferrying troops during the conquest. They've served, they've had so many uh, Valarian servings as master of ships that it essentially started to become regarded as a hereditary office. Right. So they've been very close to, Targa to the Targaryens all the time. And they've also provided numerous brides for Targaryen princes. And that is where it seems they've decided, the showrunners, that because we've decided that the Valarians are a clan of black Valerians, there we cannot have this because, well, Aegon the Conqueror's mother was a Valerian. Um, a Valerian. <laughs> Yes. Oh, and a Valyrian. Yeah, yeah, Valyrian. Sometimes actually, you get those Valyrian. She was actually half Targaryen as well. Yes. Oh, there is well, King Jaehaerys and Good Queen Alisani were actually descendants of a Valyrian, their mother, uh, Alyssa Valyrian, who was considered a cousin to uh, her husband Inus Valyrian, to because of the fact that again that Valena was part Targaryen. They they had uh, she was from the paternal side of that match. So uh, that was another marriage where Valorians had figured very prominently. Mm. Don't really know what they've done. Have they turned the Valorians into Coheruses, to Keltigars, to Targaryens, to saying they're additional daughters? Yeah. Um, they probably won't get into it unless they, they have to. Um, but yes, uh, just in case somebody is thinking that we're over reading this perhaps, there's a couple of, uh, there's, there's one quote in particular where um, Lena speaks to um, uh, Viserys when they're talking about the marriage and she's repeating the, the little speech that Corlys gave her and she said, it would be a great honor to join her houses as they were in old Valyria. Yeah. So she's suggesting that there haven't been any marriages of Valarian into Targaryen. Obviously, uh, Rhaenys has married a, a Valarian, but Valarian into Targaryen hasn't happened since uh, old Valyria. Yeah. And um, so hundreds of years at this stage. Basically. Hun hundreds of years, um, and then fine. They, they made this decision. I said we, you know, we have issues with all sorts of changes. Yeah. Um, some changes you see right away that, okay. 
uh, this is for practical reasons, uh, there's for budgetary reasons, for cutting characters, combining characters, what have you. There's all sorts of reasons that you have to make certain changes when you're adapting. Uh, on the topic as to whether, when you have to include uh, diversity, how necessary or not it is, and how where you should be putting it, uh, there's all sorts of opinions on that spectrum. Should you be just adapting works that are already diverse today? Uh, or should you be changing older works to fit what is considered appropriate today? Lots of di different opinions yeah. on that whole spectrum. Um, so we've had a lot of complaints, me particularly, about saying things about this casting, simply saying that I, I don't like that they made a change. No, I mean, it's, that, it is a change. That's basically, it is a change. So, and the, that's, you know, the complaints go everywhere from that it's not a change, despite the control numbers having acknowledged it. I mean, that, those who so say it's not a change, that, yeah. they've lost that one. And then, up until this episode, people have been saying, oh, well, it's just scoreless. And, and uh, his immediate he, family. Of course, he could have uh, some Ryland or mother that, you know, and then that's just it. And uh, it makes sense in the setting, and it's clear that they haven't done that either. Um, One thing, I, I obviously, I I don't think we see yet, but I mean, obviously from like leaks and uh, behind the scenes, we see that there's a lot of black Valorians. Um, various uh, kinsmen and various yeah. retainers. And so there's clear that there is a group of uh, black descend uh, black Valyrian descendants living on uh, uh, around the Valyrians. Yeah. And even if they don't necessarily, I mean, obviously there's a whole question, actually, actually it's a general question, like how do the, the Valyrians maintain their looks? They do maintain mm. the Valyrian looks. Are they, how far do their, the, does their incest go? Yes, because, I mean, that's where it starts. I appreciate that they, A, that they acknowledge the change. We've said this before. I really appreciate that they acknowledge that it is a change so that it's clear to fans what is sort of booking on and what is shoking on. And I appreciate them trying to fit it in and not just saying, oh, well, you know, uh, the Targaryens like Aegon and his sister, they're looking, you know, perfectly pale-skinned Valyrian. It just came out that way and yeah. we're not going to explain it. They've tried to explain it by pushing any connections further back. But ultimately, when you poke at it, it's... It, becomes difficult to see how it's worked in the long run. Uh, the Targaryens have taken brides from Lys, for example, yeah. because the Lysenni have maintained the Valerian look. Um, so the, the idea that the Targaryens can remain um, looking Targaryen without being even more inbred than they actually are, you can, you can see that there are still some sources for Targaryen brides even after uh, the destruction of Valyria. Right. But where are the Valorians finding their brides? <laughs> are, are we then to assume that in old Valyria, the Valyrian race, because it is said to be a race apart, you know, closer to gods than men, right. uh, they, they were very different. They had this and they're supposed to have this inhuman beauty, obviously difficult to get when you're casting on TV. There's not that many inhumanly beautiful people out well, there. By definition, it's basically it's impossible. impossible. <laughs> it's, it's, that's a fair point. Uh, and, you know, the jewel-toned eyes and all of this. So they, they're supposed to look very much apart from everyone else. And um, are we then to assume that this Valyrian race could include houses that have vastly different skin tones? Like there was a you know, half of them were pale-skinned Valyrians, and the other half were dark-skinned Valyrians, like light, you know, regular elves and dark elves, and they were both all elves, or they were all elves. Yeah. But then they didn't mix that often. They were essentially segregated seg or whatever. It, it, it raises a lot of questions. It, it raises a lot of questions, or is it something you're supposed to say that it's magic that they, the skin tones are, you know, we're not getting the sort of in between skin tone ultimately that the Valyrians, you know, look, I don't know, Hispanic kind of in, in skin tone or something. Well, I, think like, I, I recall reading an article uh, talking about sort of the future of humanity and, and mm. pointing to uh, Brazil actually as a That's place right, where, yeah. where, 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 which is an actual sort of melting pot and you have a quite a blend. And I was going to say, are we, is that where we're going to eventually end up where everyone's kind mm. of 
blended together to some degree. Obviously, there's when you blend them together, there's ranges. There are people come yeah. different ways, but the idea is humanity is trending towards this sort of blended together, uh, one race kind of of sort of a just a multi. Um racial makeup thing and and that doesn't <clears throat> seem to have happened in no. it has like it has basically it's like they have to create additional world building yeah to make it work and like we we as george recently said in his uh interview with our friends at history of westeros uh you know he he usually when he liked he doesn't like changes because he liked the way he did things he I doesn't mean, he may have made the shit up as he said we're making <laughs> this shit up but he doesn't like it for other people to come along and then Make the shit up differently. Uh, Other than again for practical yeah. reasons. No, 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 no. He obviously he's evolved. He's it's you a know, process, as he says. It's a do. process. There are certain things that you have to agree to change, um, and it's clear that that all of the pitches uh, that we've heard about. I think uh, of the pitches we have sort of details okay. on, privately and yeah. publicly. Uh, I think we know details on four of the, those five pitches, and all of them just happen to include efforts to find cast. diverse casts. And that's uh, it felt. And these are the ones that HBO handpicked. So HBO, it's quite clear that this was a thing that HBO was looking to. And I completely understandably, um, but I, you know, as we said when when first discussing this with people, like. There are certain roles that we would expect. I mean, there's, in particular, there's one particular role, but they're not a first season role, there's a second season role, who would almost certainly has non Westerosi heritage, who is mm. a dragon rider. Can't discuss them, I guess. Or can we? Do we spoil people on these things? I have no idea. I think we'll try and. Uh, yeah, not so be too spoilery. Uh, we'll have to wait until the second season to discuss yeah. the character. Uh, Kristen Cole himself, I mean, it. It's a stretch that he's never mentioned, but it's it's not important what, what his race is. Mm. Whereas the whole racial thing, like, the important thing is, you know, it's almost 10 years ago when George was talking to fans about the casting of characters. There were people who were very upset about uh, Pedro Pascal being cast as Oberyn Martell because he was, he's a, you know, he is Hispanic, like like me, but he's, you know, white Hispanic. He's, um, there's all sorts of Latinos, there's black, there's white, there's Chinese Latinos. Um, but he, uh, and George was like, you know, he looks like a Dornishman looks. He's, his ideas, they were Mediterranean. He was being sort of Southern European, Spanish, um, sort of like you know, Andalusian Southern Spanish and Southern Italian. Uh, but obviously, and we pointed this out to people, people got very upset and at us, that George, and, and of course, the thing is, is there's a wide range of people in the world who can look like a salty Dornishman, a Mortel. You could have Indian actors, you could have Middle Eastern actors, yeah. but you could also have, that was the thing, you could also have actors like Pedro Pascal, it was not yeah. a problem. Indira Varma, a perfect choice yeah. for a daughter of a sandy Dornish house. Absolutely perfect choice uh, visually. Um, and I don't think what well, they did with her character is not her fault, so we won't blame her for that. <laughs> no. uh, you had to remind me of that, did you? Yeah, well. I, <laughs> I wasn't going to do eye rolls on this, and now. Uh, okay, so, uh, but anyway, so we'll. Uh, but when he was talking about the Valyrians, you know, in 2013, he had lately, around the time of the show, he was obviously getting feedback, comments yeah. from people about, you know, it's not diverse. He was seeing the articles, think pieces yeah. as the usual rigmarole on the internet about the Valyrians being so white, da da da. And he thought, you know, maybe if I had to do it over again, maybe, maybe I could have, you know, I had to make this choice. I made this very mm. typical choice. It was in mm. human beauty, pale mm. skin, pale hair, whatever. Maybe I should have made them black instead. And he had some reasons why he might not have done it, but he had some reasons why he might have done it. And what the key there for me is, is, is in his mind, because the whole matter of the power of blood, the power mm. of the blood lineage. Mm. I think that's where he says it specifically the race apart as well yeah. in that one. But and like to explain yeah. their, their, their obsession, as he has mm. called their obsession of blood purity. The Valyrians are a single race. They were, he said, mm. yeah, they were white. That's the choice I made. I could have made them black. I, he didn't think I could have made them a multi-ethnic no. melting pot. No. Uh, and melting pot for Valyria, I don't know who started okay. this nonsense about the idea about the Valyrian nobility, the Valyrian lords, and most kind of Valyrians of old Valyria were a melting pot. It, it's a wrong way to look well, at like, that culture. Like, like I said, you know, we discussed this. It was a melting pot. The streets were molten lava. <laughs> and there were probably people melting also. Yeah. <laughs> the dragons uh, were melting also. Anyways, things. Uh, so uh, that's yes. where we are on that. We, our position is, is like, 
There are other characters that we would have preferred because it has less impact on the lore. They've had to change the the Targaryen family tree. But there's implications as well for if they go and, as Ryan Condal and George have discussed, the idea of doing other periods of Targaryen history. Yeah. This will have an impact on that. Yeah. What are we going to do with... Especially if it's supposed to be one canon in the show now up to... Like, yeah. And that all the shows are supposed to fit together. Um, there's a future Valarian marriage as well. Yeah, I mean, uh, that was an interesting one because, like, you say, oh, well, okay, you could have these kings who are biracial, mm. um, but then they die out and mm. without any offspring, except you have the one person who has a bastard child who begins the Blackfire Rebellions. And, like, George described that, like, this is the uber. <laughs> this is the uber, uber original Valyrian. model Valyrian yeah. Damon Blackfire. Yeah. He he is as Valyrian as they come, and he looks like people claim he looked like Aegon the Conqueror. And like how it, obviously they could change it and say it yeah. doesn't matter. That's not in the show. That's in the book. It just gets a little odd. It might be fun in some ways, I suppose, if they have this contrast. If it's then again, isn't it a little on the nose if the Blackfires are black? Yeah, the other thing about the whole thing that I find a little odd, uh, and, and it's a little complicated, but I, I'm not fully formed in my head, is like, essentially, they are not black, the yeah, no, I mean, Lorians. It's, it's a little bit difficult to... Um, um, to put together the, the, one's thoughts on this, but we've discussed it a little bit, and obviously this is a sensitive issue, so, but um, bear with us. Basically, it seems that they are treating, as in Valyrian race is the predominant thing that uh, identifies these characters, and is almost as if it is a little bit of colorblind Casting in a sense. Yeah, I mean the visually they're not that, that but is that yeah. for our benefit as the audience? I mean there is one practical reason people that keep saying it. Maybe there's a point to it. I but well by having the Valorians be black, it's very clear that they are Valorians and yeah. then you and you know which one are Vitagarians yeah. and that you don't get confused. I think that's what heraldry and colors of clothing are for, but okay. Yeah. But um to me it's like this it's almost as like they've turned it into this kind of post racial fantasy of like suddenly they don't have a race other than the Valyrian race. They're unified, yeah. and, 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 and it feels. And very in, odd. in a sense, it's in a sense, if it's something that I have argued before when it comes to fantasy and, and race in fantasy, is that I did it when we were talking about the Dornish and the whole thing that you can have anyone playing Dornish who is who has you know roughly the right skin tone uh, that works. Uh, the idea that. You can't really speak about white or Hispanic or, or, or even black in in fantasy because the, this, there's not necessarily a one-to-one -one equivalence. Um, if there's a, for example, there's a series by uh, Judith Tarr, the Avarian series, which has um, um, three fairly distinct cultures in appearance, and one of them is quite dark skinned. They are almost as I would describe as like obsidian skinned, I think. But they are described uh, feature wise as looking, I would say, Hittite. Or yeah. I mean, that's the inspiration yeah. for them, sort of Bronze Age Middle Eastern cultures. Um, rather than uh, what we would associate with black in, in, in our world. So you can have that sense of playing with race in, in fantasy as well. And then if you want to cast that, it's like, well, this is not quite what's being meant. So it's difficult. I think that in general, I prefer it if you just look away from the, the real world race of the actor yeah. and then see, does it fit what is being described? And here it's almost as if they've done that in the sense that, well, we, we are giving them the, the white hair. Like, the white hair is Valyrian. The silver or gold yeah. hair is Valyrian. Anything else is secondary. Yeah. So it's almost like they're looking away from, well, this is not really the Valyrian and, and that's what matters. 
Yeah, but then they don't. But then they they pull back because they change the whole. But whole they do piece. change like the family so, tree because then somehow they say that well, it doesn't quite work. It does so. It is not entirely consistent. It is, it is a difficult situation, obviously, but um, it's one that I wish they hadn't put themselves in. Yeah. I believe they, they wish they had made some other choices. Um, and just to circle back on that, I think that's why in our article on, um, on our not a review, we discussed the idea that you know it was an interesting idea from someone that the High Towers mm. be the be a black family, but they had some recent Summer Islander marriages or be more mixed even. They could have uh, make it their mm. policy as this trading uh, city, but they, mm. you know, have, have intermarried a lot. And I thought that was really interesting because, yes, George has this whole history for them that they are first men, that they go back to the dawn of days and all this stuff, but nothing really in the world building hinges on them remaining pure and all or pure first men. Nothing no. hinges. Like, George has this clear idea of the reason they're obsessed is because it's the, the way the magic works, the way the control dragons work, the way the blood magic work, it matters to them. So he has this, and now they've kind of this confused matters to some degree. Mm. It, that's it. That's the problem. That's it. That's the problem. Like we don't like changes. They've had to make more changes to fix their changes yeah. or try to fit them in. And I mean, like, you know, I'll complain about, you know, we complained last time about the seahorse so, the, don't or the four legged dragon, all these little things. Uh, and some of them have nothing to do with world building. Some of them like, really, why, why did they just have, why did they tweak that little detail? Why, why, why yeah. did they change that story detail? Why did they change this background detail about a character? And some of it has no impact, further impact on the, the world building. And it's still a little niggling annoyance. So of course something that actually affects the world building and requires jumping through some hoops to get it to sort of fit together of course, that's going to bug us. Yeah, it's that's yeah. That, that's it. That, that's really it's very strange, and I, I people have gotten themselves very uh, worked up over it, and there's a lot of uh, unkind things being said about us mm -hmm. and about George as well. Mm -hmm. But uh, this this seems to be a cycle. Every time a new show starts, we yeah. seem to get it from some people, and uh, I we don't care <laughs> uh we're, we're fine no it's, it's uh, just, uh, starting to you know feel very valyrian about the whole flame proof thing yeah That's amazing <laughs> yeah it's, it's, just, it's, it's, it's some of his it's such head scratchers i, I mean you know, a lot of these people i think are very well meaning but they're not really looking closely at it so I don't know. I offer no apologies for caring about the world building. Like that's no, can't do no, that. That's what I said from the start. Uh, just like George makes no apologies for saying like, he doesn't like changes. Um, mm -hmm. But I've said to other people, you know, yes, they've changed this, and George is involved. He said in his interview, he has no creative control, he has creative influence. But I'm sure he's on board with this in the sense that, well, it's that's what's needed to get it done. Needed to get it done. And they make good arguments for why them, and maybe not something else. I don't know because they. And also, he talks about the dump trucks full of, of money. That when you want creative control, they say, "Here, do you want another ten million dollars?" So two million dollars, what he said. But yeah. Oh, oh, okay, two million. Well, inflation. Yeah. Uh, but uh, basically, uh, I mean, it, it, he is directly involved in the process, and he has to make decisions about what he is. Uh, you know, what he's going to object to, what he's not going to object to, and what he sees that, you know, he knows the process in Hollywood. And just because he says, I'm fine with this for the adaptation, doesn't mean that we have to say the same. We're not involved. Don't want to be involved. Hollywood, God, no. Uh, it's... Uh, the Blood Moon one, but that, that, but that it was, was a one-off consulting, on, consulting project. A one-off yeah. consulting project, I... Uh, which is fun. Which is fun, it's yes. It's a shame, but I mean, I, I wish we had these kind of pictures of the thing they made, uh, I guess, based on what, <laughs> our input. But uh, anyways, whatever. It's buried in a vault somewhere. Yes. Um, but it's, uh, no, it has nothing to do about being upset that we're not the consultant on this thing, because I wouldn't want to have to make those decisions. Nope. It's, uh, I'm much too much of a purist to, uh, to make the compromises that are needed. Yeah. It's also very strange, very... I do get annoyed at certain people who very facetiously, oh, you know, it's just better for you to not say things, you know, you're... 
you mm. your website and your book. You don't want anything to happen to him because I'm like, I <laughs> don't want anything to happen. I, to I don't know. I, I, I'm more interested in just being honest with people yeah. about my views than I am by just hiding and pretending that certain things don't matter to me. I mean, yeah. I, they, I, I like the world building. I like things like usually like how George did them, just like George likes how he did them. I, I, you know, if, if the series had been at from the start black Valyrians, I would be complaining the other way. If they started introducing white Valyrians, I'd say the same yes, thing. Yes, exactly. It's, it's, but you can't win. Like it's no. So whatever. Time for something more fun. Yeah, much more fun. Dragon, Dragon facts. facts. Yes. There are two additional dragons mentioned in this episode, Vagar and Dreamfire. And Vagar is the last of the three dragons of Aegon the Conqueror and his sister that is still alive. Like Meraxes and Valyrian, she was named for a Valyrian deity, a goddess yeah. presumably. Mm -hmm. um, it's said on the show that her current lair is unknown, but they think it's a long we see somewhere perhaps near Spice Town. And the dragon pit is supposedly too small for her. I mean, we've seen the dragon pit, it's enormous. Yeah, the, that was interesting seeing a shot with the, the dragon pit and realizing just how huge it's supposed to be. Um, Vagar, of course, is also supposed to be absolutely immense, so it'll be really interesting to see when she first appears. Yeah, we've seen glimpses in, in trailers yes, and things. And, uh, it looks enormous. It looks enormous. Uh, has had some time to grow since the death of uh, Raxes and Valerian. Obviously, this um, interesting. This causes a little bit of an issue, or I still don't for, understand well, the for issue. some for some people it has, in the sense that I've seen people when they're ranking the dragons in size, now ranking them Valyrian, Vaga, Maraxes, whereas in a Game of Thrones, when we see the dragon skulls, or we're talking about the dragon skulls, um, it is said that you know. Valyrian was the largest, then came Araxes, and then came Vagar. Um, now, I think there's some quote about how Vagar is the... Um, after the death of, of uh, Valyrian, Vagar is the uh, largest uh, living. Yeah. And um, I guess some people have taken it to mean that Vagar grew past Araxes in size, obviously, because Vagar had a few more... It's 100 years to, to live, basically. I mean, it was in the 90s. So yeah, about 100 years. About 100 ago. additional years. But we don't know anything about dragon growth rates or, or anything like that. Or, or how know. old they were. We know that Valyrian was the one who came from Valyria. I believe what we're told is there were four dragons that came from Valyria, but by the time of Aegon the Conqueror... Valyria was the only one who was alive. So they are post-Doomed dragons, and but, maybe Maraxes was born right after the Doom? Yeah. And Vagar was born uh, yeah. ten years before... Otherwise, of course, the other explanation is that the skull they have is from Vagar as a younger dragon. <laughs> as opposed to... Vagar as an older dragon, yes. Vagar as an older dragon. Um... um Anyway, yeah, what Vag we know is that yeah, Vag yeah, what we know is that Vaga was first written by Queen Visenya, of course, and uh, during the conquest, um, he, uh, Vaga did briefly get a passenger, uh, the uh, boy king Ronald Arryn, when Visenya visited the uh, the Vale to get the Arryns to um, submit, yeah. uh, he got to fly three times on uh, Vaga's back around the giant's lands, and when he landed, he was just the Lord of the Vale. So, yeah. So that was uh, quite a, quite a trip there. Yeah. And then after Visenya's death, uh, Vagar seems to have been unclaimed until Prince Balin, that's the father of Viserys and Daemon, yeah. uh, became her writer. And when he was killed, um, or when he died yeah. from, from his burst belly, she seems to have been left alone. Um, at least up to the point of, of the show. The, the, Yes, More will come. Vagar will, will feature. Uh, precisely why nobody has claimed her, maybe it's a little bit the fact that she's also starting to get a little bit on the old and slow side, yeah. just like Valerian. Exactly. Because uh, I think even, doesn't even Visenya comment at some point about her fires still burning hot, that she's getting a little on the older side. Yes, I believe um, so, yes. Uh, which is obviously now quite some time in the past again. So dragons have a long old age, just like they have a long life in general. They have a, a period where they've gotten quite 
large and cumbersome and they're no, no longer so agile, but they still they can still be quite fierce. Her coloring has been a topic in the fandom. I uh, we went for a very long time without us having any idea. And then in 2021, for 21, 2021 uh, Song of Ice Fire uh, calendar, Sam Hogg uh, revealed that George had settled on the color as bronze with greenish blue highlights and like, like jade green eyes. Um, what we've seen it doesn't seem quite, when I think bronze, I do think it's a little more metallic. I don't yeah. seem to have quite gone that way, but we always caught a glimpse. I do think the green eyes, however, is there because there's mm. been some posters. Um, then the other dragon that gets mentioned is Dreamfire, um, also referred to as a she dragon all the time. And first written in 35 AC by the, the then 12 year old Reina Targaryen, the old, the, not the elder, the um, sister of Jaehaerys and. Um, good Queen Alessani. Good Queen Alessani. Yeah. Um, Dreamfire is mentioned in the Sorry, sorry the, the older sister, actually, sorry. Oh, yeah. uh, Dreamfire is mentioned in the context of this being the egg that uh, Damon takes, uh, the same egg that Rhaenyra had selected for her brother Balin's cradle. And uh, interesting is that Dreamfire seems to be a bit unlucky then, with maybe they took inspiration from that, because uh, in the book, uh, Dreamfire has three eggs stolen. Or there are uh, Raina has uh, three of her eggs with her, I guess. She's laid several clutches. And uh, her close friend Alyssa Farman takes the three eggs to finance the ship that she wants to build to uh, sail around the world, I guess, essentially. Uh, or sail west in particular. She yeah. wants to go uh, she wants to cross see the sunset sea. No one's ever yeah. done it before. Yeah. Or has ever done it before and then returned. Done it before, and, uh, and neither does she. But she. Um, she takes the eggs and she sells them on, and eventually they end up with the. Or does she sell them directly to the Sea Lord? It seems to sell them directly yeah. to the Sea Lord. So the Sea Lord of Bravos gets these three eggs and they end up in his menagerie and leads to a interesting diplomatic discussion involving chickens and that the Targaryens will be fine with it as long as there are no well eggs are fine but as long as they don't hear any rumors about chickens having hatched out of those eggs yeah. um, so um that was a fun scene in the in fire and blood yes yes that, that that's a good one uh, so yes uh, egg uh, eggs can be very valuable it's interesting that they refer to it in the episode as a stolen a dangerous weapon uh, which i suppose um Eventually, it, it, it would be, but um, not at the moment, and it has to hatch. They don't always hatch, even when they put them in the cradle with children. They don't always hatch. No, that's true. So it's a bit of a gamble. I guess that's it. We've covered kind of everything we wanted to cover, discussed the controversial matter. and Yes, uh, I guess we'll have to put in a little um, timers for people if you want to skip over the lengthy rambling on that topic and just go to the... Dragon facts and, stuff, and, and stuff. Dragon yeah. facts at the end, exactly. All right, until the next episode, oh. I, I think I saw the title release, but I don't recall what it was. Um, but whoever that is, we will be back next week. Yeah. Hopefully on time. We're kind of that weekend. We're actually off traveling, so we're going to try and record uh, beforehand and get it all ready to to launch after the episode mm. airs. Uh, knock on wood. Um, until then, thank you. Bye.